Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you, God, for your promises. Thank you, Lord, that everything we need to get to know you is right here, Lord, in your scriptures, in your book. Father, I ask over these next half an hour, hour as we hear from the word, as we come and continue in our worship, that it would be your will above everything else be done in this place. That is what I ask, Father, in your mighty name. Amen. Amen. So I won't say good morning. There we go. So this evening, I'd like to focus on three particular scriptures that will hopefully should outline a theme. So the first one of these three scriptures we're going to be looking at a bit more is Genesis 1, verse 26. And in Genesis 1, verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So that's the first one. The second one, John 3.16. There we go. See how many times we've got to squeeze that in over Easter. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And the third scripture we're going to be looking at in a bit more detail is Romans 8, verse 35. And it says... In Romans 8, verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? So I'm going to use these three scriptures and outline a theme. And I suppose that theme could be demonstrated in two different ways. The first of which is, how the Lord sees us through his eyes. And the second one would be, God loves you deeply. But if I just simply said, God loves you deeply, then that would be a very short, simple message, and we can all continue in our worship and have some uh, tea and coffee afterwards. Whilst it's very true, it's an easy statement to brush off because we hear it all the time, especially when we're not in the right frame of mind. So let's expand now on Romans 8, verse 35, and I'm going to read Romans 8, from verse 31 to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Truly, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything in the charge of God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he concerned, condemning? It is Christ who has died, but rather also who is raised, who is also at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, like we read before? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. As it is written, for your sake you are killing all day long. We are counted as sheep of slaughter. But in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loves us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor heights nor depths nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is Christ Jesus, our Lord. And I love how he could simply say nothing separates us, but the Lord, knowing us, outlines it in great detail. I'm going to read Psalm 15, verse 1 to 3. Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name give glory, because your mercy, because of your truth, why should the Gentiles say, 
So where is their God? But our God is in heaven. He does whatever he pleases. And God does whatever he pleases. And whilst he desires that we might love him as he loves us, we get a choice in the matter. But there are things that we don't get a choice in. We don't get to choose the depths of the Lord's love for us. We don't get to choose that. The Lord loves us whether we like it or not. I'm going through a few examples of how extreme that love goes. And if possible, I'm going to try and stay away from the cliches. Although I did say if possible. You know, Easter's coming up. And we'll be talking about the cross and the resurrection. And whilst the majority of the country barely recognised Easter, other than it's a part of spring and the time to buy chocolate. So the first core example I'm going to look at is Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11. Of one of the extreme examples of how the Lord loves us. So it says in Matthew 4, verse 1 to 11, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Not sounding very Eastery, all of him, so far. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God... Tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the devil took him to the holy city and let him stand on the highest point of a temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, but it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands. And if you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is also written, do not put the Lord of your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the devil left him, and the angels came and attended to him. The kingdoms of the world and their glory, all these things I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. How does that demonstrate in any way the magnitude of God's love? So let's look at the situation. If, this is the big if, if Jesus had fallen down in worship, which he did not, but if he did, bearing in mind the Trinity, it would have been almost as if God himself would have bowed down before the enemy. Can you imagine the implications of such a thing? A servant listens to their master and does their will. And the master's way comes first. Yet Satan was daring enough to ask a part of God to bow down before him. What absolute, for the lack of a better word, idiocy on Satan's part. Who in their right mind would attempt such a thing? Yet that's not the first time Satan's attempted this. The first time he got cast out of heaven for wanting the worship of God to be directed towards himself. You would think, Satan, knowing this, he would know not to ask a part of God to do this. In fact, I will go as far as to say he does know, except Jesus is fully God and fully man. Satan knows a thing or two about getting into man's head. So perhaps this is his golden opportunity. Satan wants the bragging rights to say, look, God, your son, he's bowed down before me. Come on, I'm waiting. 
except, as we know, that did not happen. It was the Holy Spirit that led Jesus into the wilderness. And the Lord does not lead people into a situation that is helpless, without help, and that they cannot handle. It was absolutely vital that Jesus was tempted in every single way so that he could qualify for the cross, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God, who had all the temptation to sin, but chose not to in every instance. And of course, Jesus in no way submitted to the father of lies, except Satan unwillingly put himself in a difficult situation. Because in Matthew 4.1, as we've said, then Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. The Lord God was in absolute control and it was absolutely necessary for Jesus to be tempted in every situation. It's not sin to be tempted. It's sin to fall into that temptation. So Satan's golden opportunity was reversed and turned into a part of bringing salvation to the people, bringing the gospel to save souls. Now how does this show the depths of God's love for us? Because just for a moment, if Jesus had have bowed the knee, which of course we know he didn't, or listened to Satan's advice, which he didn't, it would have given cause for God to be called a liar. Now, of course, I'm going to be very clear here. God is not a liar. God is not a liar. God is not a liar. I feel like I have to say that a few more times just to be very clear. God cannot be corrupted. God cannot and will not go back on his words. God's promises are true yesterday, today, and forever always. So if Jesus had have bowed the knee, and it sounds wrong, doesn't even say it, it would have given cause for God to be called a liar, except he's not a liar, he is not a liar, he is not a liar, and his word is true. Yet in order to save humanity, yes, God gave his son, and thank you, Lord, but he also gave the slightest little opportunity For Jesus to be tempted. But of course, even though he was fully man, he was also fully God. And the Lord was in absolute control. And no matter how that temptation was real, the Lord stood and the word of God is true. And Jesus got through that temptation by using the words of God and the conviction to obey the Father's will above all other things. And the next example of the true depths and lengths of God's love for us and our value, or should I say, how he values us through his eyes, is in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 17. And I'm going to keep reading. But as God had distributed to each one, as the Lord had called each one, so let him walk, and also... I ordained in all churches. Was any called having been circumcised? Do not be circumcised. Was anyone called in uncircumcision? Do not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but the keeping of the commandments of God. Let each one remain in the calling which he was called. I'll read that again. That each one remain in the calling that which he was called. Were you called as a slave? Does it not matter to you? But if you were able to become free, use it rather. For he who is called a slave in the Lord is a free man of the law, Lord. And likewise, he who is called a free man is also a slave of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not be the slaves of men. Each in whatever way he is called, brothers. In this, remain in God. Now these verses are what I like to call justification to walk as the Lord calls you to walk. Now it's not very catchy and you're not likely to find that on a t-shirt. 
we weren't cheap. You know, and I heard um, this joke. Two friends were having a conversation. First friend says, you're so cheap. You never spend money on anything that you need, even when you need it. Second friend goes, hey, I'm not cheap. First friend, fine, free. There you go, not very funny. It was fine, free. It's important to combine the previous verses we looked at with the following verse from Luke. It says, Luke 14, 28, For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and first and count the cost, whatever he may have enough to finish it? Now God Jehovah counted the cost. He had enough to finish the task and decided that the sacrifices were worth it which also includes Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. One of the first obstacles that people find often when they come to faith is the reality that the Lord can do exactly what he pleases. And he has a right to do it. Because he created the heavens and the earth. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when the Lord asks us to give our lives to continuously follow him, to give our everything. It is nothing that the Lord is not prepared to do for us. Matthew 22, verse 37 to 38, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And this is also what the Lord has done for us. He loves us with all his heart and soul and mind. The Lord is not asking for a love that he himself does not give. And going back to Genesis 1, 26, the Lord made Adam and Eve intentionally in his likeness with a clear pa plan, not pan, a clear plan and a clear purpose. Now, what was Adam's and Eve plan and purpose? Well, they were to look after the garden Genesis 2.15, and the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to tend and keep it. And the Lord gave them a purpose, just like we have a purpose, except that's only half the picture. Why does the Lord create Adam and Eve in his image? As we've already read, the Lord has a right to do what he pleases. He created mankind because he thought so it right to do so. For he did not see it right to do so, he wouldn't have done it. Why didn't the Lord, when Adam and Eve fell, simply destroy everything and start again with a perfect template? Because it is not in God's nature to leave or abandon. And he loves the world deeply enough, even though the world does not love him the same. The scriptures often refer to the church as the bride of Christ. It says in Revelation 21 verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Yet the Lord wishes for his bride to choose him, and for no other reason than they want him and they love him. The Lord wishes to walk and talk with us in the cool of the day, just as he did with Adam and Eve before the fall of mankind. So rather than discarding us, he set a plan in motion. He set a journey in motion. He knows that we don't love him the same that he loves us. In the same way that the Lord knew there was no suitable partner for Adam right from the start, but instead of just blasting information at Adam, he took Adam on a journey. And where Adam uncovered that there was no suitable companion. And when Adam knew this, God then got involved and uncovered the next part of the journey. This is why the Lord gave us his word, so we can continuously go on a journey and get to know him, fall in love with him, and seek after him and serve him. And as we looked at this morning, you know, Psalm 119, verse 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. 
The Lord uncovers each step one at a time. As we get to one step, we might be able to see the one in front of us, but we can't see miles and miles ahead. Adam's journey was a journey of uncovering that he needed a suitable partner and that the Lord made a way for the next chapter in Adam's life. It's God's great pleasure that he takes us on a journey even before the fall of mankind. And the Lord never changes his nature. Even when Adam and Eve chose sin, chose the opposite of what Jehovah set out for them, the Lord then revealed the next step in the journey. Except this step that he chose will be the final one, one of restoration. And you can look at Genesis 3.16 and John 3.16. Mankind walked away from God to choose death. So now, in Christ, we have hope. Our value in Christ, rather than simply discarding us, which would have been a much easier way of going about it, instead, the Lord chose to restore us, to keep us, and to send us on a journey. Even though the law was given to Moses and the children of Israel, rather than blasting them all with the information piece by piece, in its proper time, the Lord revealed himself and the Lord gave the Ten Commandments and they went on this journey as a nation. Yet the law only points out that they are not good enough, so we know we need a saviour. Psalm 119, verse 33 to 35. Teach me, O Lord, the ways of your statutes and I shall keep it till the end. Give me understanding and I shall keep your law. Indeed, I shall observe it with my whole heart. Make me walk in the paths of your command, for I delight in it. How are we viewed in Christ's eyes? It's so simple to brush off the words, he loves us. And yes, Christ died for us, and he is obedient to the Father. But the Lord God also, gave as much as was necessary that we might come and be with him and be restored rather than discarded. You know, a two pound watch, once it breaks down, we might as well, you know, oh, we'll get another two pound watch. You know, those packs of three for a pound on the pound shop. Um, They're not particularly valued. And when God created Adam and Eve, that perfection, and God said it was good. We were more valuable. We were exactly as the Lord has intended. And when we went from that to sin entering in, we went from exactly as the Lord intended. And we could have gone from that to the pack of three for a pound watches we were corrupted we were in sin we were dirty we were filthy and we were helpless but rather than discarding us like the three for a pound watch much like in the same way that if we purchased a watch with significant value we would want to repair or restore it but we can only restore the watch when we have the right tools the right funds and the right know-how, or the right people. The Lord chose to restore at his own cost, rather than to discard. It wasn't just Jesus that gave his all. It was the Father who also gave his Son and everything that was needed to see our restoration that is still yet to come. So whilst it's easy to brush off the words, oh yes, the Lord loves us. Whilst he could have very simply discarded us, that was not in his nature. And he he chose to restore us. And we are still in that restoration process. But he chose to restore us at significant cost. Why? Because it was his will and his pleasure to do so. Just before the fall of mankind, 
God took Adam on a journey. And likewise, it is still his pleasure to take us on a journey with restoration. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thanks, Dan. It's good for us to be reminded sometimes, isn't it? Just of the love of God. Just how much he loves us. Just what it, what it all was. You know, coming up to Easter. And we sing lots of songs about it. And quite a few of the songs say, uh, I'll never know how much it cost. And that's dead right. We really will never know how much it actually cost. Not just Jesus, but Father God as well, to be separated from his son, and the son to be separated from the father. How painful that must have been when you think that they'd never been separated before. For that instant, when Jesus took our sin, and God had to turn his face away. Ooh, it, it, it gives you goosebumps. It gives you goosebumps. But it's the reality of how much God loves us. And I just want to say thank you, Dan, for bringing that, because it is good. We need to realise the depth of God's love for us. We need to realise that. And that should motivate us on to go on that journey, to carry on that journey with the Lord, to strive out, to say, Lord, what? why am I still here? Have you ever wondered why you're still here? You know, we um, talked about it this morning a little bit. You come to accept Jesus as saviour. Why can I not just go straight to heaven then? But that's because, one, there's other people that need to know about him. And two, he's got a job for you to do down here. He's got something for you to do down here. And this church is very much about you finding what that is. Finding what that is and then running with it. And we will help you to run with it. We will help you to run with it. So as we are seeking the Lord over this time over Easter, remembering what he did on the cross, remember that isn't the end. You have something that you can do for him. Our life is now given back over to serving him, to bringing him glory, to pointing back to Jesus. That's what we are here for.